Hi everyone, happy new year and welcome to night school. I'm Lynn. I'm Aria. And we're part of the nightlife night school team at Cal Academy in San Francisco. We mix a little science, music, culture, and more bringing this to you both in person at our weekly Thursday night nightlife events and virtually on our monthly night school programs, which are on the first Thursdays of every month. Hope you all had a nice and safe holiday season. Uh, today is our first night school of the new year, and we are kicking it off with a theme we introduced last year, which is New Year New Species. Um, from the lowland forests of Madagascar to Easter Island's coral reefs, Academy scientists described 70 new to science planet and animal species in 2021. Um, tonight, you'll be hearing directly from some of those researchers. Aria will introduce them. Yeah, we've got, as always, um, a very amazing lineup <laughs> of very, very cool folks. And uh, first up, we're going to have Allison Young, who is a marine biologist and co-director of the Center for Biodiversity and Community Science at the Academy. Wow, words are hard today. <laughs> she's uh, been involved with coastal monitoring and community science work all over California. Um, and she's going to talk a little bit about how new species and community science are interwoven and more. Uh, then we're going to have Dr. Christopher Ma, who is also a marine biologist and a sea star expert, currently based at the Smithsonian National Museum of National, oh man, Smithsonian <laughs> National Museum of Natural History. Um, and he's actually been involved with the Academy since his high school days. So he, he and the Academy go way back, which is very cool. Um, and he's going to talk about some of the, some deep brief sea stars uh, that are beautiful and amazing. And uh, finally, last but not least, we're gonna have Dr. Matt Van Dam, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Academy in the entomology department. And his research broadly focuses on building and refining the arthropod portion of the tree of life. And we're excited to have him here to share his research on a newly, descri newly described Easter egg weevil, um, which you will see, and the colors are pretty amazing. Um, so really exciting stuff that we have coming up here. Um, and a fun nerdy music fact um, from our night school DJ, Richie. Um, so you might have seen that it was a sea star there, but the, maybe the sounds didn't sound exactly appropriate. But um, Richie actually took some cool, well, he was kind of mixing two of our guests tonight. Um, so Matt, um, the weevils that he's gonna talk about are um, from the Philippines. So Richie actually put in some some animal sounds from a Fili from the Philippine cloud forest. So a fun little mix of our guests tonight. Um, but back to the program. So as always, tonight's program is live. Um, so continue saying hi in the chat. Hi Tom. Sorry, that one just came in. Um, let us know where you're watching from. If it's your first time joining us, you're a night school regular. Um, stay tuned for Q&As after everyone's presentation. Uh, make sure to get your questions in and we will now turn it over to Allison.
Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, happy to be here. Uh, yeah, so I'm Allison. I co-direct the Center for Biodiversity and Community Science at the Academy. Um, and my presentation tonight, um, I'm kind of making the case for how it really takes all of us, or at least a whole lot of us, uh, to truly understand biodiversity, especially at a global scale. Um, so hopefully tonight in this presentation, you'll understand not only how you can help us document biodiversity and species wherever you are, but also why you should uh, go out and document the species around you as well. So the Center for Biodiversity and Community Science is part of the research division at the Academy. Uh, and we have four kind of big overarching goals. The first one is to kind of just teach people about like what is the science that happens at natural history museums? Like what is natural history science? And then to actually engage people in that sort of science. So anyone who wants to. Uh, we also want to connect people to their local nature to have people really embrace and understand that there is biodiversity around you no matter where you are. Uh, we want to build community both in person and online around nature. And then uh, really importantly, we want to collect and then use biodiversity data for science management and conservation. So that means kind of at the core of what we do uh, in the Center for Biodiversity and Community Science is that we create events and campaigns and build partnerships that get people out documenting biodiversity, get, get them to um, meet other folks who are interested in nature, um, and also teach people how to actually go out and document the species around them as well. Um, and then we take the resulting data and other folks as well, um, and we use it, we analyze it, we model it to kind of understand big questions about where species are in the world and how potentially their ranges are changing. Um, and then to also with our partners, partners um, help them make better informed decisions around like management and policy for species um, here, especially here in California. And so to kind of give you kind of a concrete example of the type of work that we do, we do work all across California and we actually even have some global projects, um, but we really started uh, our community science in the tide pools. Both myself and my co-director, Dr. Rebecca Johnson, we're both marine biologists and we both really love the coast. And so when we were starting our community science program, we wanted um, not only to get people out there because we have questions about biodiversity along the coast that people collecting data can help us answer, um, but also we really uh, wanted to connect people to the incredible biodiversity that we have along the California coast. And so uh, when we started our, our program about 10 years ago, we started working uh, to document and monitor the biodiversity at this place called Pillar Point, which is along the San Mateo coast uh, here in the Bay Area. Uh, and you might know it as Mavericks. It's where the Mavericks surf contest happens. But during the low tide, this like huge and incredibly biodiverse rocky reef is exposed. And when we first started working there 10 years ago, there wasn't even a species list for Pillar Point. You know, So you can't really... Um, Ask, answer questions or even manage the species in a place if you don't even know what species are there. Um, so we put out the word and asked volunteers to come work with us uh, to document the biodiversity at Pillar Point and understand how it might be changing through time. So you might be thinking to yourself like, that sounds really hard to volunteer to do. Like tide pools are incredibly diverse and there's lots and lots of weird species out there. There's tons of species that look like other species in the tide pools. Like these three anemones here are actually three different species, but they look really, really similar to each other. There's also hundreds of species of like algae and kelp in the tide pools as well that can be really hard to learn how to tell apart. There's lots of really tiny things in the tide pools, like these little, little tiny sea spiders, for example, that are out there, but lots of other little tiny organisms in the tide pools. There's also like weird big things in the tide pools too, like these chitons that look like meatloaf <laughs> wandering through the tide pools as well. Um, and especially fun in the tide pools, uh, there's a whole bunch of organisms that you might look at them and say, I don't even know if this is like an animal or a plant or algae. Um, so it can be really hard to learn how to uh, identify all the organisms that are out in the tide pools. And if you're wondering, um, those first two organisms actually are animals, and the third one is an algae <laughs> out in the tide pools. Um, but the great thing is, is that we uh, use the iNaturalist platform to have our volunteers document biodiversity. So you don't actually need to know what it is that you're documenting. You just have to be able to take 
a decent enough photo that other people can potentially identify it as well and be able to say, you know, this thing looks really different from this thing. So I'm going to take photos of both of them. So it makes it really easy to participate um, in this process of documenting biodiversity, because as long as you have the ability to take a photo and share it with iNaturalist, um, you can do that. So iNaturalist is uh, both an app and a website, and they're both free to use. They're, it's a platform basically designed to let people share their observations of nature and like create an official record that like, I saw this particular species at this place on this date. Um, it's also designed to help people with um, identifying those observations and also being able to kind of explore and see what other people are seeing around the world as well. Uh, so the way that it works, um, basically uh, most people start off using the app and I definitely recommend if you're interested in, in partaking in this process, download the app, that's a great place to start. Um, and what you do is you take a photo of the thing that you wanna make an observation of. In this case, this um, yellow organism right here uh, is a sea slug or a nudibranch um, out in the tide pools. You take a photo of it and then when you use your phone, it automatically records the date um, and the time that you saw it, it automatically records the location as well using the GPS. Um, when you tap that little unknown view suggestions box, iNaturalist, if you have any sort of mobile connection, iNaturalist actually has um, artificial intelligence or what we call um, machine learning built into it. Um, and based on the photograph you took and also where you are, it will give you suggestions for what it thinks that organism is. Um, so you can see on a, in the third screenshot there, it's like suggesting that it thinks it's in this genus. It's giving me suggestions of um, you know, yellow nudibranch species that look really similar to that photo I took and have been seen around me. Um, so I can choose any of those. You can also type in, if you know what this is, you can use that species search box at the top and you can type in the species, or you could just say like, I know this is a nudibranch or like, I know this is an animal. You can put any level of identification that totally doesn't matter. Um, and then what you do is you upload it and you share it uh, to the iNaturalist platform. And that's really where the power of, of using iNaturalist comes in, is that it's this giant online community of people who are interested in nature. So when you share your observations, people who um, know that particular group of organisms, like in my case, people who know nudibranchs along the California coast can see my, organ my, see my observation and then help me with that identification. They can say like, yeah, you got that ID right, or, or you know, get it closer to species if I put a high level ID or they can actually uh, change misidentifications. So that's the great thing too, is that you don't need to worry about misidentif uploading misidentified things. It's totally fine. Um, people are totally nice and will help you change that ID as well. So here's that exact same observation. Now we're looking at it on the website. The website is really different from the app and I definitely recommend checking out both. Um, but you can see it has that photo that I uploaded. It has the map of where I saw it. It has the date that I saw it as well. It has the ID that I picked, which was that CLON, which was the very first suggestion iNaturalist gave me. Um, and you can see two other people from the iNaturalist community have chimed in and said, yes, this is a sea lemon. Um, so now we have this official record that this organism was found at that place on that date, and we know what it is. And so the cool thing is that, you know, no matter why you're using iNaturalist, you know, for any reason, if you're just interested in like documenting the things in your backyard, or you see like a weird spider in your bathtub and you're just like, what the heck is this? And that's why you're using iNaturalist. It doesn't matter. Like all those observations are actually contributing to this amazing global database of where species are found around the entire world. You can see there's 88 million observations that have been made by almost 2 million people around the world on iNaturalist. And this was just as of this afternoon, that number con consistently goes up. Um, and so this data is hugely valuable to understand where species occur around the world and also like through time how those species ranges are changing and how places are changing like communities of, uh, of species that live in particular places how those are changing through time as well. And also really importantly the information in the iNaturalist record is literally the same information that we have in our museum specimens and the, you know, the 46 million specimens that we have at the Academy, um, the other, you know, other museums that have specimens, universities that have specimens. If you go and you look at that label on a specimen, that exact same information is there. It says, here's what this species is. 
Here's who found it. Here's where they found it. Here's the date they found it. The only difference is that a specimen is an actual physical object. And I naturalist, you have a photo as your evidence as well. And so the cool thing is, is that we can actually use this data together to understand change through like a really long period of time, you know, as far back as museum um, specimens go, which is pretty awesome. So going back to Pillar Point, like I said, we've been um, working with volunteers out on this out on this reef, out in these tide pools, um, for over a decade now. Um, and so us and our volunteers, and also people who have just gone out there because they've heard it's a cool place and they've made observations of well, as well. We've made over twenty nine thousand observations just out on this one reef, and have documented over seven hundred species out at Pillar Point, which is truly incredible. Um, so, like I said, when we first started working out there ten years ago. There wasn't even a species list for Pillar Point, and now it's arguably like one of the best known um, sites along the entire California coast. All just you know documented by folks who've gone out there and taken photos and have volunteered their time, which is really really amazing. And so not only do we have this incredible species list, we've also been able to document some really other important things. Uh, for example, back in uh, 2014, sea star wasting disease hit our coast pretty hard, and in particular, this species. Um, this two, this, uh, these two photos right here are the same species, the ochre sea star. Um, it hit that sea star really hard, so we were able to document um, sea star wasting disease out at Pillar Point. But also, we've been able to document kind of the slow, but um, you know, seems to be on the right track recovery from sea star wasting disease. Like we had a bunch of baby sea stars show up um, soon after wasting disease hit, and we've had a bunch of subsequent adult stars now out on the reef as well. We've also been able to document um, environmental, like when we have events, um, different environmental condition events along our coast, how that affects the species at Pillar Point. So uh, back in 2015 and 2016 was our last big El Nino along the California coast. And what we started to see was all of these Southern California species moving up the coast, you know, up into Northern California where they don't normally occur. Um, so for example, this amazing creature right here is a nudibranch. Um, called a Hopkins rose. It's a sea slug, um, bright pink like this. In a normal year at Pillar Point, we might see it, you know, two or three times in a whole year of being out there. But in 2015 and 2016, this became the most common and most abundant nudibranch out at Pillar Point. These guys were literally everywhere, um, as, as well as a bunch of other southern species that have kind of had moved north with the, with the warmer waters. So we've been able to document like how changing environmental conditions um, affect species and also potentially gives us a glimpse into the future with climate change as well. So we've been gathering all this amazing information from this place at Pillar Point and had all these incredible volunteers who were out there and documenting biodiversity. But we, what we realized is like, we want to know if what we're seeing at Pillar Point is happening in other places along the California coast. Uh, so we started this project called Snapshot Cal Coast, which is now a yearly event. It happens every June for about two weeks. And we work with partners from the Mexico border all the way up to the Oregon border. And they mobilize their own communities. They hold events. They get the word out and uh, basically get people out to document their biodiversity along their stretch of, of coastline. Um, and so what we get every June is literally a snapshot of the entire California coast biodiversity, uh, which is really cool. And um, we now partner, we've been doing this since 2016, and we now actually partner with the state of California, the California Ocean Protection Council. Um, and they're really interested in using this data that's collected, you know, by, by anyone, by everyone, uh, to, uh, to make better informed management decisions along the California coast for species. So we've been able to take this data um, gathered by volunteers along the coast um, and track change through time. For example, so this is that ochre sea star again, the one that was hit by sea star wasting disease in 2014. That black line right there shows you how we totally picked up that huge decline in those sea stars just through these photos that people were taking along the coast. Um, and same thing with that Hopkins rose, that nudibranch that became really abundant during the 2015-2016 uh, El Nino. We can totally pick that up also just with people going out to the coast and taking photos of things. And really importantly, too, is that we can, by tracking change through time, understanding change that's already occurred, we can actually make better predictions for how things might be in the future. Um, and so, again, the state of California is using this information so they can make good decisions uh, based on current conditions but also taking in mind what places and what species are going to be doing potentially in the future as well. Um, and this is really key to better managing species along our coast. 
So I really want to uh, impart the fact that every observation is important. You never know when you're out there making observations how that, that data point might be used to answer these really, really big questions. But I also just want to really quickly at the very end here give you a few examples of how like one observation has been really important. You know, when we have two million people around the world out there documenting, you know, searching for and documenting species, we are bound to find things that we didn't know, that things that are unexpected and unusual. So I just want to give you a few examples of how one observation has really been important. Um, starting here in the Bay Area, uh, this is an incredible nudibranch that was found here actually in San Francisco Bay by people who are just looking under docks in San Francisco Bay. Um, and this turns out to be a new species occurrence record, um, not only for California, but actually for an entirety of North America. So by people using iNaturalist, we've been able to find species in places that we didn't know were there, you know, that we, we knew they were in other places, but people have now been able to document them in a new place that they're showing up in. Um, so this species was normally, um, had only been documented previously from Asia, and this was the first record, again, not just for California, but for all of North America, uh, which is pretty amazing. Um, we're actually even able to track in some cases, even really, really small things like viruses. This photo right here is actually the, not an observation of the roly-poly, but of the thing that turns that roly-poly blue. <laughs> um, and it's called this invertebrate iridescent virus 31. Um, and through iNaturalist observations of people taking photos of blue roly-polies, we were able to document this virus, um, its first documented uh, movement into Australia, which is pretty amazing. Uh, people using iNaturalist have also found lost species, so species that have been documented in places and then hadn't been seen for, you know, however many years. This, like, really unassuming little slug was found down in San Diego by someone using iNaturalist, and it turns out it had been documented there 68 years prior, but hadn't been seen since. And so it was thought to be basically gone from the area, but folks using iNaturalist have rediscovered it, and this has happened with other species around the world as well. And finally, people have actually found undescribed species, you know, species new to science using iNaturalist. This frog um, was documented by someone who used to just go out on their porch in Colombia at night and take photos of the organisms that showed up on their porch. Um, and one night they happened to take a photo of this frog and the right people saw it on iNaturalist and were looking at it and were like, we don't know what this species is. So they like launched an expedition down to this person's porch in Colombia. Um, and was able, were able to collect this species, and it turns out it had been undescribed. And so this is a basically a new species to science found by someone who is basically just taking photos on their front porch at night. And there's multiple um, examples of this from my naturalist as well. So hopefully, I have made the case for why we need you, why we need all of us, or as many of us that are interested in doing it, to document your local biodiversity using iNaturalist, because you never know how that one observation you make might be used to answer big questions or might be a super important observation just by itself. So thank you guys very much. Hi, Allison. Um, thank, thank you so much for this. This was delightful to watch. And um, for <laughs> anybody out in the audience, uh, feel free to let us know if any of your questions and um, we will field them right away. Uh, but just, just to start off, I think about wandering meatloaf often. Um, <laughs> when I, like, it's pretty when amazing, I, I know. <laughs> like pretty amazing species that exist like in our local California titles. Um, yeah. like very cool. And also so cool that you guys actually, like you all documented 700 plus species in this one place, like over so much time, like that is, yeah, pretty amazing. Yeah. You know, and some um, of those species were like, things that have only been seen there like once in the 10 years we've been working out there. So like super common things, but also really rare things that were just like, who knows if we're ever gonna see it again, but it showed up that one time, you know? Yeah, and now you have a record of it for like, okay, yeah. like if it comes back, like we- <laughs> We mark it down as super, super rare on our species list because it's hardly <laughs> ever seen. But yeah, you know, it's one of those things that we can not only just make that species list, but we can also like, yeah, we now know like the species that like only show up in the summer or like the species that like, you know, only show up during El Nino years and things like that as well. So it's like even more than just a species list. It's like this amazing species atlas that's, that's been built by these hundreds of people who've gone out and, you know, donated their time basically to take photos of things in the tide pools for us. Yeah. And like the the fact that it's all like temper, like tied, tied through time also like yeah. is, yeah, pretty, pretty phenomenal. Um, yeah. yeah. And it, it just sounds like overall, like very much like the basis for understanding broader biodiversity is 
these observations, right? Like, yeah, yeah. You know, and I gave, I was trying to give kind of a concrete example. So I picked the California coast since that's where we've been working for a really long time. But there's examples of people using iNaturalist data, you know, especially now that iNat's been around for, uh, you know, over 10 years of people like using it in like to using the data to really kind of tr start to track change through time as well. It's like, you know, if, if you compare the amount of iNaturalist data to like the number of museum specimens in the world, like iNaturalist is like, very quickly outpacing, you know, like those collections. Cause again, like it's another big reason why we really love to get people involved. Like there's just not enough biodiversity scientists in the world to like truly track all species globally through time. Totally. So the more of us that are willing to go out and take photos and share it, like, you know, that's really what it takes. So. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That's pretty amazing. Um, <laughs> and uh, kind of along that line, like with, with, like specialty biodiversity researchers and, um, you know, connecting with people who are making these observations, like how, how do people get, how do researchers get connected with INAT data or how do people get connected with INAT data? Um, yeah, yeah. Like no, it's a great right question. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and, and that's, that's another really nice thing about iNaturalist is that, uh, you know, the data are open to everybody. You know, so like, you know, if you had a question or if anyone had a question about like, oh, I wonder what species are found like in this park that I really love you can download those data. And the same thing with, mm -hmm. you know, scientists who have big questions about, you know, I really want to know where this species is found around the world. Like they can download that data. Like those data are open to anybody to answer the questions that they have. And then especially those observations on iNaturalist that get those IDs verified where people on iNaturalist are like, yes, this is the right ID. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we call those research grade observations. And then those are actually shared with other bigger databases. Um, there's this really important one called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which makes it sound like it's a giant building somewhere, but it's basically a bunch of servers. <laughs> and they have, like I said, you know, a museum specimens and iNaturalist records are both species occurrence records. And so GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, also has a bunch of, you know, has museum, digitized museum records on it as well. And so that's a great place to go, you know, so if you cool. have questions like change through time for, you know, more than just the 10 years iNaturalist has been around. If you want to know, like, where were people finding the species 50 years ago and where are people finding it now? Like, that's great that iNaturalist data is shared there as well, where you can get that historic perspective also. Yeah, like really combining and synthesizing everything that we have. Yeah. That is very, very cool. Um, and we have a question from Tom. Uh, are you seeing trends of large numbers of invasive species and, and just generally like along the California coast or like further inland or? Yeah, you know, I mean, the coast is what I know best. Um, and the great thing is, is like we don't see a lot of invasive species along the coast. There, there are a couple, but generally when invasive species show up, um, they tend to show up first in harbors and bays, you know, cause you think about how invasive species, especially marine species kind of make it around the world. Like it's often through shipping um, that mm -hmm. species show up. Although like we have much better, better measures now than we did in the past to try to make sure those species aren't actually being transferred around the world. But usually when we see uh, new non-native species um, become invasive, they tend to do it in bays and harbors first. And there's a few examples of organisms that have like made it out to the coast from bays and harbors. But on the whole, the California coast is pretty resilient to non-native species. It's, it's our our bays and our harbors that like, you know, I think San Francisco Bay is mostly non-native these days, you know, um, that have a harder time with it as well. But yeah, I mean, obviously invasive species are a huge um, problem on land in California too. You know, when you think about like non-native plants that take up space that, you know, native plants, you know, can't have anymore, things like that, who don't have predators that are like eating them and things like. Um, so yeah, I know invasive species are uh, a bigger issue on land than they are along the coast. Gotcha. Okay. I, I didn't know that. That's like very interesting that it is um, <laughs> like so concentrated in, in the water and along the coast. And yeah. Yeah. Like happens very differently on land. Um, and uh, a question from Jackie in the audience. And I, mm -hmm. I think uh, I'll, I'll let you go after this one because uh, I'll, as always, many questions. But um, what is the most spectacular sighting that you've seen? Um, like animal, plant, algae, something, in, I don't know, like something oh. that you mistake for one and it's the other. <laughs> Man, it's it's so hard to say. I mean, like, it's one of the things I love about tide pooling is like, I loved, like I tide pool for work, but I also tide pool for fun because there's always this idea that you can like see, potentially see something that you've never seen before. Like, even though you've been working in the tide pools for like 20 years, like I have, like every time I go out there, I'm like, I might see something today that I've never seen. And that's so cool. I think 
one of the most interesting things that we found is when we were out doing a bio blitz uh, for Snapshot Cal Coast with a bunch of folks. And one of the folks that were out there with us found the head, just the head of a wolf eel with these like amazing pink teeth. You know, when we had like all these questions were like, why is it just a head? Why does it have pink teeth? You know, and it led us down. There's actually, if you search the Cal Academy's website, we actually made a little video about this whole observation and finding this wolf head. But like we went and searched the collections to see if we could find other wolf eels with pink teeth and like, you know, talk to our, uh, talk to some of our curators and our collection managers and ichthyology about like, what's going on? Why would we find just a head? Like, did something eat it? Did someone catch it and just leave the head? Like, so it was just this whole rabbit hole of like one question leading to another one. And it was just such an amazing find. <laughs> yeah. So, so did you, I mean, did you end up finding answers or is that like a go find a video? And well, we, well, we think, thing. well, the, the, the pink teeth, um, very much like how sea otters, like their bones and their teeth will turn purple from eating purple urchins. Uh, a lot of wolf eels eat red urchins. And so they get that like that echinochrome staining on their teeth that turns their teeth pink. And it was they, they beautiful. They look like rose quartz. It was such an amazing find. And then our, one of our curators of ichthyology says that it's pretty common for fishermen, even though that it, we were in a place where you shouldn't have been fishing, uh, fishermen mm -hmm. will often cut the head off and just take the body with them. And so he was like, it's probably left by someone who was out there fishing. But like, that's kind of a bigger mystery. We're not exactly sure. So. Gotcha. Some yeah. some open questions. That's, yeah. that's okay. We love that. Yeah, <laughs> we love fun. Open questions. <laughs> that's that's pretty amazing. And um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing uh, about your work and and these like fantastic stories and uh, for joining us today. And and um, yeah, we will we will pass it on to our uh, next speaker, which is uh, Chris Ma. But but yeah, thanks, Allison. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. Hello. Um, uh, I can certainly attest to the effectiveness of iNaturalist. I use it. Uh, I help identify a lot of those uh, myself. Um, I'm a, a, an expert in sea stars. I reside at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Um, I'm really grateful to the Academy staff for inviting me to give this talk tonight. Um, I'm happy that so many of you have joined me. I see several of my followers from Twitter. Uh, hi, Lisa. Hi, Leslie. Hi, uh, Robin. Um, thanks very much. Uh, tonight, um, I'd like to talk about new discoveries from the Academy Collection uh, from Rapa Nui, new species of starfish. Um, so um, <clears throat> one of the things that I'll start out with is just general terms. Um, I'll, be, I'll throw around the word mesophotic a lot tonight. Uh, the mesophotic zone is a very particular uh, depth range in the ocean. Um, so uh, this is roughly a depth between 30 and 150 meters. Um, this is an area where the sunlight starts to pinch out. Sunlight penetrates the, the top 200 meters of the ocean. And so the sunlight's really important to uh, all sorts of life uh, at the surface. It powers algae, it powers corals, it powers all kinds of photosynthesis. As we get deeper, however, um, the light has less and less of an effect, temperature, et cetera, et cetera, nutrients, et cetera, et cetera. And below 200 meters, we get into what's effectively the deep sea, uh, an area that is traditionally considered uh, a very different kind of uh, habitat than the upper part of the ocean. But it's this transition zone that makes uh, the mesophotic so interesting. That's why it sometimes goes by the name twilight zone because of this uh, intermediate um, range of environmental factors. It's a new area that is currently being explored, and there are a lot of things that we still don't understand about it. Um, I'll discuss uh, Rapa Nui. This is what's also been known as Easter Island. It's a South Pacific island, uh, which is overseen by uh, Chile. Um, the Academy sent uh, an expedition there in 2017. Um, a lot of the specimens I'll discuss were collected by uh, three members of the mesophotic dive team. Bart Shepard, who uh, is the director of Steinhardt Aquarium, uh, Luis Rocha, who is a, a curator uh, at CAS Ichthyology, and Tyler Phelps, who was the dive officer. Um, they actually were using uh, what's called rebreathers uh, to uh, study these very deep areas, which is generally well below uh, standard scuba diving depth, as, as we'll see. Um, the Academy um, surveyed a lot of the environments around Easter Island. 
not just uh, the really deep mesophotic areas, but uh, subtital shallow areas. And there were many discoveries to be had. Um, sea cucumber, or excuse me, uh, sea slugs, uh, sea urchins, um, fish, uh, many new species. Um, and then uh, three of my colleagues uh, who were on the expedition, uh, Rich Mui, Gary Williams, and um, uh, Terry Gossliner, all contacted me regarding the fact that they were seeing observations of sea stars, sea stars that they didn't recognize, but certainly I would. So this was very exciting. Um, I come back to San Francisco every year, uh, sort of like the swans in Capistrano. I come back every year, and uh, that uh, winter I was able to uh, survey the collections at Cal Academy, visiting, if you will, my home away from home. Um, and uh, I was able to look at these specimens from these expeditions, and I discovered that, much to my delight, they were undescribed, new species. Um, and so I proceeded to describe them. Uh, in some cases, this can be a fairly straightforward process, but as one of my advisors once told me, there's no such thing as a, as a short uh, paper. And so um, I began, uh, the more I studied them, the more uh, other factors became an issue. Uh, and so um, I'm uh, generally uh, a sort of global curator. Uh, not only do I study museum specimens and uh, uh, starfish at my home institution in Washington, D.C. at the National Museum of Natural History, um, but I also, of course, work at the California Academy of Sciences, and I also spend a fair amount of time in Paris at the Museum National d'Histoire Naturelle, and this becomes relevant, as we'll see. Um, another thing that was happening concurrently was that I was asked to identify images from uh, submersible dives operated by uh, the Chilean uh, Universid Universidad Católica del Norte in Chile, uh, run by Dr. Ariadna Mecho. Um, and um, this is something that many of you who follow me on Twitter are familiar with. I identify a lot of image images from video. Um, I, I'm frequently a contributor to Okeanos and provide identifications of uh, weird deep sea things on Twitter uh, quite often, as many of you are probably familiar. Um, but they were surveying a lot of the diversity of seamounts um, in Rapa Nui, coincidentally. Um, and so they had lots of interesting images and data that I was able to combine with all of the uh, specimens that were collected by the Academy expedition. Um, probably the first uh, that I'll just start out with, these were the three most prominent of the species described. Um, this is called Hacelia rara. Uh, Hacelia is a, a genus um, that occurs uh, both in the Atlantic and the Pacific. Um, the species epithet rara is actually a Rapa Nui word, which means rough and rugged. And as you can see, uh, the reason for that is because the surface is covered with tubercles and all kinds of bumps and rugosities. Um, interestingly, and this was something that began as an interesting trend, um, the closest sea star that is related to this actually occurs in the East China Sea. Um, and so uh, this began an interesting trend that, that I'll, I'll continue talking about with the other species. Perhaps the most spectacular of the um, species that I described was not only a new species, but also a new genus. Um, it was called Uokiaster ahi. Um, this species was the genus. Uh, Aster, of course, is the root for star, but Uoke was named for a, a god, a Rapa Nui earth ocean god, Uoke, who created Rapa Nui by using a lever and essentially tilted the surface of the island up to sea level, upon which the lever broke and the island was uh, established as uh, a surface area uh, at the surface of the ocean. Um, the species name Ahi actually means fire in the Rapa Nui language and alludes to the bright orange and red color of the species. Um, a very odd coincidence happened while I was uh, uh, researching this talk. It turns out there's actually a prophecy that Uoke would return in 2020. I don't know if that actually means that uh, my sea star is the return of this god or not, but it was a very strange uh, coincidence. Um, very interesting was uh, that the mesophotic team saw this at a depth of 33 to 110 meters. So that's about um, 90 feet, multiplying that by three, that's about 90 uh, feet uh, to uh, uh, three, so about 
200 to 300 feet. Um, and uh, the ROVs operated by the Chilean uh, scientists uh, found it much deeper at 160 and 180 meters. Um, and so uh, this is something that, again, is sort of part of this overall trend. Um, and this is something that demonstrates this trend um, uh, even better. This was a species called Linkia profunda. Uh, profunda is uh, Latin uh, for deep. And uh, that was because most people associate the genus Linkia with shallow reef species. This one was collected at a depth of 76 and 110 meters uh, by the mesophotic team. Um, but then uh, I was studying uh, sea stars in Paris and their collections uh, were trawled from New Caledonia, uh, which is an island over 8,000 kilometers away. And it turned out that they have the same species in New Caledonia from uh, 180 to 540 meters. And so this species truly occupies both the Mesophotic and these deep sea areas. Um, and so this started uh, begging a lot of questions. Uh, how do Mesophotic you know, how widely occurring are mesophotic species? Do they occur in deep water commonly? Is this a trend? Is this something that you can say about the fauna of, uh, of, of species occurring in, um, in the mesophotic? Um, and on top of everything else, this also kind of uh, uh, is meaningful to the fact that there is kind of a biogeographic break. Uh, this is a, a feature relevant to a lot of biologists between the Eastern Tropical Pacific, which is essentially the, the waters around the equator close to the western coast of North America, um, excuse me, nor, uh, North America, Central America, and South America, and the Indo-Pacific, which is this huge span uh, of, um, uh, of ocean, uh, including the North Pacific and the Indian Ocean. Uh, so there's kind of a, um, a lot of interest in looking at, at the changes in faunas between these two uh, very uh, widely occurring areas. And so if the same species occurs both in Easter Island and New Caledonia, that is very interesting. Um, another thing that we saw, which further uh, brought my interest into this relationship was that we saw a sea star observed by the Chilean ROV uh, of, a sea, of a sea star called Asheron Aster, um, which uh, was observed between 160 and 180 meters. Um, uh, this was also uh, this species is also seen in New Zealand and New Caledonia. And so, again, this begged this question, um, what are the relationships between these species? What kinds of uh, uh, factors are involved with uh, these widely occurring uh, genera or species? Uh, how do they, um, how, how are these relationships, how do they diversify? How do they evolve across these uh, broad oceanic regions? And um, this was not the only time that I've seen this in mesophotic species. Um, and uh, among the first species that I described when I worked at the academy uh, was one called Astrosarcus itipi, which is this orange thing that is literally the size of a pumpkin and literally has the texture of pumpkin skin if you uh, actually cut it open. Um, it, it was amazing to find a new species this large uh, in the 20th century. Um, and more so, it turns out that at mesophotic depths, it's widely occurring. It's present not only, um, it, we, we found it in Palau, but also around uh, 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 French frigate shoals near the Hawaiian Islands, um, uh, uh, in the Southern Indian Ocean, at Reunion Island. And um, now we saw it a few years ago uh, at uh, on the Western Australian uh, coast um, in the Indian Ocean. So uh, lots of mysteries there. Uh, Bathy for Dina Arie, uh, which was seen a few years ago in the Philippines by our divers. And um, all the more interesting was that uh, we found this new species. There's actually a new genus and species of Oreasterid, which was collected from Vanuatu by the aquarium uh, in 2017. Uh, it's only recently been released to us for study. Uh, and so it turns out to be a new genus and species as well. And so uh, as we learn more about it, uh, perhaps it will also yields uh, a similar pattern. Um, but I wanted to study uh, Uoki aster uh, because it belongs to a very discreet, but also a very interesting group of sea stars uh, in the family Asterodecididae. Um, there are two Atlantic species, one of which is a fossil from the Eocene of Florida, um, but there are others that occur in the Eastern Tropical Pacific on different islands. 
Um, and then one genus called uh, Asterodecidides, which are known as firebrick stars. And these firebrick stars occur throughout the Indo-Pacific. So I uh, studied all of the external uh, features of these animals, and I analyzed them using their external morphology um, and uh, came up with what is called the phylogenetic tree, kind of a pattern of their uh, evolution and th their dispersal uh, throughout the area. And so what I found was that um, there's a branch of them which uh, is present in the Atlantic. And so we saw goniaster in the Atlantic along with the Eocene um, uh, fossil called Kyanaster. And there's a west to east diversification pattern where a bunch of these uh, uh, East Pacific uh, species, and these were interesting because they're all what's called monotypic. There's one species uh, present in every genus. <clears throat> so they're kind of one-offs. They're um, unusual uh, sort of experiments, but they all occur on different isolated regions along the coast of uh, the central tropical uh, Pacific. So um, Amphiaster occurs in Baja and Mexico. Polya, uh, another spiny sea star, occurs in the Galapagos um, uh, and, uh, and so forth and so on. Um, Uwokiaster from Easter Island turns out to be uh, most closely related to Asterodecidides, which is present uh, throughout the Indo-Pacific. That means it's found uh, not only in um, uh, Hawaii and sort of New Caledonia and uh, uh, New Zealand, but occurs all the way uh, west to the Indian Ocean in South Africa, Madagascar, and uh, these places that, um, and so, and there are some 20 species. And so basically it was uh, as if there were, uh, there was a species that made it across it had some interesting experiments in the uh, tropical Pacific on these islands, seamounts, and discrete areas. And then once it gets to the tropic, into the Indo-Pacific area itself, there is one genus that takes off and just becomes really successful uh, in that wider, greater tropical Pacific span. Um, and so how are these kinds of patterns interesting to us? Why and what do they mean? Um, and that's uh, something that allows us to put kind of a, what's called a phylogenetic or an evolutionary framework around other aspects of their biology. Um, one of the important things that is relevant to this is that Asterodecidides is a predator on sponges, or at least the ones, these are still very poorly known, but the ones that I've studied, are, are they tend to feed on, um, on sponges. And uh, sponges are very important in a lot of these ecosystems. Uokiaster also may feed on sponges. It's plausible. Uh, we've seen cases in the deep sea where sea stars will voraciously attack sponges. Naturally, um, they affect what's called community structure. Uh, you've heard perhaps of the crown of thorns. The crown of thorns feeds on different corals. Under natural circumstances, they do so uh, in monitoring. Um, they do so affecting the, the structure of coral species in its habitat. So um, as we can, if we can place this into an evolutionary context and a biogeographic context, we can look at how uh, these have changed through time, but also across these areas. In other words, um, maybe food is what dictates their evolution. Maybe this is all relevant to, uh, you know, to the changes and to the patterns of these animals in these areas. Uh, new species are the first step towards understanding um, uh, these habitats. Know the players before you uh, have the play. Um, and this is just to uh, elaborate, not just something that I'm just throwing in there. Uh, one of the reasons this became uh, significant to me is that the uh, Chilean ROV observed a goniaster, a cookie star, some people called, call it a, a, a ravioli star. It's kind of a Rorschach test for goniaster and sea stars, I guess. Um, and it was feeding on an antipatherian, what's called a black coral. And you can see it very nicely there, the sea star is sort of uh, munching along. The top half is uh, um, is bare, and the lower half uh, still has polyps, which are the animal on the skeleton, and it's sort of just um, using its stomach to devour them as it proceeds along the stalk. Um, and so, um, other sea, could other sea stars be important predators in uh, these mesophotic ecosystems? Um, these are all things that await our description and our study, but allowing us. But these new species and looking at the relationships allows us to tell uh, these kinds of stories and to look at how 
uh, all of this comes together. Um, and looking and, and so just from the basic uh, description and looking at how it fits into a con broader context, we can look at um, ecological relationships and and uh, how all of that comes together. Um, and so um, coming together is, of course, a lot of what I, I've shown here. That's also the message that Allison had earlier. Um, uh, and uh, and so this research happened because uh, I've worked at different museums. Uh, and I've uh, in, I've been uh, asked to be involved by different institutions. The Chilean uh, imagery from the video, um, uh, the museums in Paris, California Academy of Sciences, uh, scientists who've sent me images and pictures, uh, all of it's come together uh, in uh, a really uh, nice little study. And uh, I'm really happy that uh, this paper has been uh, uh, given to me as a presentation for the Academy's uh, night school. Um, I wanted to thank people who've uh, assisted me during this um, uh, during this study, all of my colleagues in the invertebrate zoology department, uh, my home away from home for some 30 years, um, including uh, Liz, Chrissy, and Joanna, as well as my uh, scientific colleagues, Rich, Terry, and Gary, the staff at the aquarium, as well as ichthyology, uh, Bart, Louise, and Tyler were the ones who photographed a lot of the images and collected the specimens. Um, and then uh, last but not least, all of my other staff and colleagues at uh, the uh, museums in Paris and DC, uh, and uh, perhaps most useful, uh, I thank the uh, individual who created the Rapa, nu Rapa Nui Rongo Rongo language site, which permitted me to um, uh, name several of the species in uh, Rapa Nui itself. Um, thanks very much. Um, I'm happy to take questions now. Hi, Chris. Thanks so much. Um, this was this was amazing. I hope <laughs> so cool. Run too long. <laughs> <laughs> We're a little long, so I'm going to get right into questions, but no okay. worries. Uh, okay. But we, we have so many, uh, so many good ones. So first, Dan asks, uh, how does the Academy and other natural history museums decide where to go to collect specimens and send expeditions? Because it sounds like there's a whole lot of <laughs> ocean out there to explore. Um, a lot of deep I'll space be honest. Um, I, I can <laughs> speak to the generality of most museums and, um, you know, where they choose to, to launch expeditions. Um, sometimes it's a matter of who they have good relationships with. Um, they have colleagues. Um, you know, there are places that sometimes are known for biodiversity. Uh, you know, scientists have an expertise and the expertise, like say if, if, for example, you wanted to launch an expedition where there were lots of crabs, um, you would go someplace with a high diversity of crustaceans. So, I mean, it, it really varies by institution how it's, it's decided. Um, it's also a lot of times uh, dependent on um, uh, funding. You know, an expedition to Baja is uh, a little easier for people. Uh, you know, at at say you know at the at the academy uh, than it would mm -hmm. be for the academy to go to say Antarctica. Um, I mean, it, so it, it really does, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really does vary, um, and uh, you know, and and but a lot of times the expeditionary work collects a lot of specimens that sit in collections waiting for people like me to study them. It said that there's an average of some 21 years uh, between the time that specimens uh, are described or put on the shelf after collection before they're described by scientists. Now, this is obviously an exception here because these specimens literally were sitting on the shelf for, you know, a hot minute before I got to it and described it. And, you know, it took the process of describing and writing up the paper took maybe two years. So, you know, that, that was very rapid, but, um, uh, but, you know, but not everything that is collected is used right away. Um, but mm -hmm. that said, you know, there's a lot that has uh, a lot of interest and scientists from all around the world have the advantage of time. So, you know, if we have a big collection of bryozoans and a bryozoan expert comes along uh, in five years, they have the benefit of that expedition to fall back and study it. Yeah, that's a really cool um, overview of how it's like, oh, it's not just for now, it's like for the future and we're building this. Oh, yeah, this yeah. Out. I mean, it's so collaborative. Yeah. That's totally. that's actually something that's really amazing because you can look at specimens that, I mean, in some cases, they're preserved accurate well enough that genetics can even be used to study, yes. um, uh, you know, things like uh, deformation from disease or, I mean, there's all, 
a collection is a resource that you, you, you know, that is a creative gold mine. You know, everything mm -hmm. from damage on fossil. Like people I know who study fossils look at uh, damaged legs on uh, what's called feather stars, and they look at the rate yes. of damage and predation. You know, so you can look at the literally the rate of uh, uh, ecological rate of predation from fossils 500 million years ago. You know, so and there's a lot of them in many cases. Uh, so you know, it there's a lot. You know, the the specimens from living collections are are equally interesting. I'm currently describing new species uh, from Antarctica that were collected in 19 in the 1960s. And I mean, wow. you know, from 3000 cool. meters, uh, you know, it's hard to say whether they'll even still be there in five years. So, um, you know, so lots of interesting stuff. So yeah, um, wow, that is like, <laughs> absolute like mind melds, like very, <laughs> very cool stuff. Um, and I, I'm trying to decide on like one more question to ask. Uh, so, so um, uh, with sea star specifically, and uh, yeah, with sea star specifically, are there specific characteristics that you look at to determine yeah. species like from um, one another? Like you talked about looking at the morphology. Sure. So, sea stars are basically, and all echinoderms are actually big three-dimensional puzzles. Um, I mean, I don't mean that figuratively. They're literally you know, made of individual pieces, hundreds to thousands, or not hundreds, thousands, oh, maybe hundreds, um, hundreds to hundreds of thousands of skeletal pieces that are all held together with tissue. And um, they articulate into essentially three elaborate three-dimensional boxes. And they have lots of surficial accessories, spines, granules. Um, they have sometimes have skin on them. Um, they're they're basically big, uh, uh, you know, three dimensional puzzle pieces, and um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, and, and they're colorful, and there's all a bunch of crazy stuff with them. So um, being able to, and so a person like me can look at how these have changed, um, you know, across different species, whether that change is just variation, you know, the equivalent of a human having one, you know, a, a thumb that bends back or not, uh, to something that is a real difference between separate biological entities. Um, this, this is not useful. Of course, this is useful, of course, when you have fossils, as I, I study uh, from time to time. But one of the more actively uh, researched things nowadays is uh, the use of molecular data, where people yes. can pull different loci out of genetic, uh, the genetic, the, the tissue from different species, and, um, and can create uh, a, a a similar kind of uh, phylogenetic or family tree that can then be compared against uh, the morphology of the specimens. And so um, in this way, you know, I mean, so even though I'm describing a lot of them, as they say, old school um, by external appearance, these will later be tested probably by me or one of my colleagues. Maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe I won't. But that's the whole process of science is testing hypotheses. And so when people say every species is a hypothesis, that's what uh, we're talking about. It always gets tested, um, but it's always a group effort. Um, and uh, so mm -hmm. I, I follow Allison's lead, uh, you know, in that uh, uh, this is not something that I do by myself. It happens because lots of people uh, help me and collaborate and, uh, uh, you know, and are, you know, as I've, I've been at the Academy for the last two weeks, and, uh, you know, I've been helped by uh, numerous people uh, who made my visit uh, quite worthwhile, including yourself. So thank you. And to everybody who is uh, tracking and watching the uh, presentation, thanks. I'm glad that all of you made it. Uh, so thanks very much. Yeah, no, thank you, Chris. Like, I, I love that every new species is a hypothesis. Like, every science is collaborative. These are very, like, wise, I think. Lessons that you're <laughs> kind of leaving us with. So. That's not what everybody yeah, calls so me, much. but sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just just take it, take it and run with it. <laughs> the wisdom. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, and it's we're going to bring on our next guest, uh, Matt. Next to talk. <laughs> Thanks again. Hello. Um, yes, welcome. Uh, let's see. Yeah, there are the slides. Okay, uh, so my name is Matthew Van Dam. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the California Academy of Sciences in the entomology department. 
the day I'm going to be, well, this evening I'm going to be talking about how the Easter egg weevils got their spots. Phylogenomics reveals malarian mimicry in pachyrhynchus. Okay, so first let's define mimicry. Mimicry is an evolved resemblance between organisms, sometimes between objects, so sometimes an animal will look like a rock or something like that. Sometimes there's crickets that will resemble stones. Um, but most, and most of the time, it's a defense against predators. It's a defense against predation. Species often give warning signals to potential predators, and this is termed aposematic signaling. Sometimes these signals can be truthful. So say you're a snake and you're a poisonous snake and you have a pattern that looks like all the other poisonous snakes in your area and that's termed malarian mimicry. Or sometimes it can be deceitful, where you're a non-venomous snake looking like a venomous snake. So giving a warning to a predator like a coyote or something that, hey, don't eat me, I, I might bite you and make you really, really sick. Um, and that's, that's termed Batesian mimicry, um, where it's a, a false signal. So today we're talking about Pachyrhynchus. So way back, even in the time of Darwin and, Wall Wall ah, Darwin and Wallace, um, they knew about Pachyrhynchus. And these are some of Wallace's observations on Pachyrhynchus. He noted that it had these extremely bright colors as well as this extremely hard cuticle. So their, their exoskeleton is extremely hard. So when you try to put a pin through one of these um, insects when we prepare them for the collection, it'll actually bend the tip of the pin so much it'll turn that, that sharp point into like a little hook um, and so you, you often have to kind of like drill the pin in to get it through the elytra on, on these beetles. So they have an extremely tough uh, cuticle and these bright colors. So maybe this is a, a, a warning signal to predators that, hey, I'm not, a, I'm not worth your effort to try to eat because I'm really tough and crunchy. Um, and they don't seem to have any um, poison or venom these, in these weevils. Um, and there have been some very good experimental studies that have tested this hypothesis, seeing, you know, if we alter the color patterns, do, are predators able to recognize them? And, you know, do they, do they, can they crunch them with their bite force or they just spit them out? And they just spit them out. Um, and so they don't have any venom. They don't have any toxic chemicals. They're just not palatable. They're just not tasty. They're just not worth the effort. And so that's what these warning signals on, on uh, Pachyrhynchus are about. But interestingly, there's other beetles that pick up that have evolved the same sort of um, signals. Um, and on the, on the very right here, you can see these two serum viscid beetles, these ones with these long antennae, um, and, and the genus Dolyops. And they have a very soft cuticle, and they, they evolved to look just like the Pachyrhynchus weevils. But there are also other Pachyrhynchus that look like each other. So there's the the Batesian mimicry between the, the serum viscids and the pachyrhynchus and the malarian mimicry just within pachyrhynchus itself, giving off these warning colors. Okay, so next slide. So a little bit more about pachyrhynchus. Pachyrhynchus is a genus of weevils, consists of about 145 species, 93% of which are endemic to the Philippines. Um, and here's a picture of the Philippines and this teal color is the Pleistocene sea level. Um, so a lot of these separate islands are actually interconnected in the last Pleistocene. So what affects color patterning in Pachyrhynchus? Is it the local composition, composition of the mimicry complexes? Is it the biogeography, sort of uh, who got there first? Who got there first, occupied the area, and then drove the patterning of subsequent um, colonists? Or is it more just random to sort of the genetic underpinnings um, regulating the color patterning. But to address these questions, first we need a good genome to, to, um, and a phylogeny to start. So generated a genome for Pachyrhynchus sulfur maculatus and then aligned that, that genome to other ones that we had developed throughout the genus and related genera to pull out conserved elements and then use those to construct our phylogeny or our deep time genealogy. That's what you can think of these branching patterns instead of um, between relatives, like your close relatives, like your parents and grandparents and cousins and, and, and nephews and such. Um, 
it's between different species on the, the orders of millions, tens of thousands to millions of years. So that's what this, uh, these black lines represent. So each one of these ones at the tip is an individual that we sampled. And then on the one next to it would be its uh, sister taxon. So that's how you interpret these types of trees. So what we can see here in the phylogeny is that Pachyrhynchus is what we call a monophyletic genera, I mean, mo excuse me, monophyletic genus. So it doesn't have other uh, genera hopping out inside the group. So it forms one complete group. And it's closely related to these other ones, um, which come from New Guinea in the genus Pantorites. Um, and they have a sort of a different um, type of warning signal. Instead of these bright, brilliant scales, they have these weird sort of warty growths on them. Um, and here's a picture of a weevil that mimics those. And this is in a different subfamily of weevils with this long rostrum. Here, here's Pantorites on the top, and here's this Al Alutilia on the bottom. And instead of, this one has scales, and instead on the Pantorites just has these sort of warty growths. Um, so that's kind of cool. So it looks like this sort of hard cuticle and these bright colors evolved early in, in the Pachyrhynchini, but, and it was Pachyrhynchus that really capitalized on the brilliant colored scales. Um, instead of those warty growths. So here's the phylogeny with all the, the, the different species plotted at the tips of the tree. And one thing that sort of popped out to me is that you see these some of these ones with these really net-like um, patterns on their elytra, which seem really elaborate and you would think would only evolve once, but they're popping up multiple times throughout the phylogeny. So here's another group up here that has it. Um, with some other related ones with a slightly different shape. And there's some other ones in, down in here that have this sort of open circles, sort of these open polka dot colors. And so there's a lot of different color patterning going on here, of these really distinctive bold patterns. Um, a little bit about the biogeography of Pachyrhynchus. One interesting thing that we noted when we reconstructed the biogeography is that it seemed to have a, a, a mostly Luzon origin. And then they dispersed and colonized other islands, but never back colonized onto Luzon. So this is something that you might expect with um, these beetles that have these aposematic colors. If you're, if you're a, a newly arriving um, beetle to an area that's already occupied, and you have the wrong color, you're going to get picked off right away. Um, and be selected against and not reproduce and leave offspring. And so then we reconstructed um, different traits on our phylogeny. That's what these um, nodes are at the base. They code for a particular state. So these, these um, blue circles are for filled. These green ones are for open. And these um, orange or orange yellow ones are for ones where you can have both states in the populations or in the species rather. So there's some populations where you get both sort of an open banded and a closed banded color morph in the same population, um, but at much different frequencies. And so that's what that orange is for. And so one thing when you map these traits and reconstruct their ancestors, which are these nodes, it's telling you that in the ancestor, they went from these open and filled banded ones to populations that were then either just open or filled. And if you look across all the different color patterns, you can see that there's many different independent origins of say spots or this sort of Moroccan tile type pattern or these stripes in the red, they come up a different bunch of different places. And so now we know that there's not just one single origin different color pattern. So this is starting to give us even a little bit more evidence for that mimicry really is going on. So it's not that these different species are mimicking each other might be just because they're each other's closest relatives. And it's no, it's an independently derived trait, um, independently evolved trait that they're looking like each other. It's not just because they're um, each other's closest relatives. And so just to help visualize this, um, this sort of um, multi-state um, condition that you would have where you'd have sort of both of these very different drastic, you know, color morphs in one population and then you get some event, could be biogeographic, could be 
um, a, a different predator comes into one region and not the other, and then it selects for just one or the other of the uh, pattern types. So it could be closed banded it's getting selected for, it could be open banded it's getting selected for. And if that happens for a long enough period, then you end up with different species because of lack of gene flow between those two different populations that end up being different species. And so when we look for these sort of instances of mimicry across the Pachyrhynchus phylogeny, we see that there's, there's quite a, a good number of them um, and that they're often from very different parts of the, of the, the, the phylogenetic tree. Um, and so you can see these ones at the top in the dark blue on, on uh, sort of southern and central Luazon. Um, they all have this sort of like stripes and checkered marks, or there are these ones that have these two vertical lines in blue here in northern Luazon. Um, there are these sort of open uh, circle morphs, color morph uh, between these two different species in very southern Mindanao. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting things going on here. And so it really does look like there's quite a bit of malaria mimicry going on in Pachyrhynchus. And so what might be driving this? Well, from what we can tell from museum records is that it's, there's usually one species that is, that's at a much higher frequency um, than the other. So in Luzon, um, there's this one species, Pachyrhynchus monoliferus, on this one B and D and F here. And then there's a, a less abundant, larger species of Pachyrhynchus in the A, C, and E. And so we think that whichever one is most abundant, that's what the predators are queuing in on. And so then it's sort of forcing those other one, those other species that are co-occurring together um, to look like the one that's most abundant so that they don't get um, misidentified by predators and accidentally eat. So the ones that look like the most like the ones that are most common, leave more offspring and reproduce and so forth. Um, and there's some very cool different uh, color patterns here, I think. Um, and so what's actually making these color patterns on the beetles? Well, it's sort of similar to butterflies in that they have scales, um, but, it, but on beetles, the scales just don't instantly rub off like they do on butterfly wings. Um, they're much tougher, but these are structural colors on these scales. So they're not uh, a pigment that's derived from, uh, from a, from a particular um, protein pigment like you would see on uh, that, that red frog that, that Allison um, figured. Here, these are structural colors and so they're, they're bending and refracting light. And so in, inside each one of these scales, so here's on A, there's a, a picture of a, a Pachyrhynchus orbifer you zoom in on that area, you start to see all the little scales and you zoom in on an individual scale and you can see that it's faceted of different sort of colors. And if you break open one of those scales, you would see this sort of honeycomb structure of all these little, um, basically sort of like waffle-like structures. And that's actually what's bending the light uh, at the nano scale. So on the bottom there, it's about 10 uh, nanometers. And it's sort of similar to this uh, impressionist uh, pointillism. Uh, painting where you kind of get an aggregate of these different sort of colors making one sort of unified color. So in these blue scales, you can sort of see it that there's lots of different fractal um, bits. Um, these larger ones have slightly diff larger domain sizes as figured in C. And that's just a different orientation of the of the of how the crystals are stacked. So one might be um, going this way and then another one might might be coming in this way, and that'll make a slightly different color and sort of make a glittering effect. So when you actually look at these weevils, they kind of glitter. Um, just look like a lot of little bits of glitter covering them that are actually just the scales. Um, but they do some other interesting things. These scales, um, some are what we term uh, ordered, which are these, these sort of ordered waffle-like patterns, but some just sort of get amorphous and term disordered. And those just sort of tend to bend um, the light in all sorts of different directions. So they either appear sort of light blue or white. And so that's how these beetles get that color. And sometimes you can find both different types on, on the same individual. And what makes the elytra sort of those bright red metallic colors um, is that if you actually cut through the elytra, just like if you just cut it just like straight down, 
um, you would start to see that it's that it's individual little tiny stacked layers, um, and that's what we term a multi-layer reflector. And so that's reflecting, bouncing light back out um, at a particular wavelength. Okay, so now for the the new species. Um, so we've found a actually quite a lot of new species, but today I'm just going to focus on the two that we've described. Um, and so we're going to go to uh, the south end of the Philippines and the island of Mindanao. We'll zoom in on, on Mindanao, and now we're going to go into this little tiny scrap of habitat um, right there uh, north of Davao City. Um, so that's where we found Pachyrhynchus, I mean, excuse me, not Pachyrhynchus, uh, Metap uh, Metapocryus um, um. We named it after the University of Mindanao, um, who paid for some of our, our, our travel expenses. And then I'm going to show you some pictures of Pachyrhynchus obamanuvu, um, which is found sort of in this region right here, uh, the sort of the near Mount Apo, which is the, the, the highest point in, in, in the Philippines. It's found in just these little tiny um, bits of habitat that are left. Um, and so here's where the Metapocryus was found, um, just in this one hill. And that's something that's very particular about a lot of insects is that they have often will have very restricted ranges. And so you can just go from on one part of the mountain, even you go one side to the other and you can get completely different um, fauna uh, depending on the plants. And so this is about at 1,300 meters. Um, and so it's this pretty mossy cloud-like forest here. Uh, here's a picture of Metapocrytus um, um, has some of those same sort of scales. And this is a picture of the male genitalia, um, which we avert to help uh, identify them. That's because there's a lot of um, sperm competition to fertilize the eggs of the female. And so there's a lot of selective pressure on the male genitalia to be very efficient at um, removing sperm from, from previous males. And, and so that they're able to leave more offspring. So you get these really sort of crazy looking um, endophalli, which is what we call them um, in, in the male genitalia of these weevils. So here we are collecting on that, on that little hill and you can see it's quite mossy and we use these um, beading sheets that just go around and, and um, sort of hit the vegetation and let the beetles fall out onto these sheets and then um, pick them up to collect them. And another technique that we use here is Milton, um, who, who also helped describe um, the Pachyrhynca species. He's doing some leaf litter sifting, and that's a technique that we use to get up the, the beetles that are in the uh, leaf litter, because actually there's just as much, if not more, diversity in the leaf litter in these tropical forests than there is in all this vegetation. Um, and so here's some pictures of some leaf litter weevils. I particularly like these. Um, they're quite diverse uh, in tropical regions not so much here in, in North America. But you can see there are just so many different species of these, tens of thousands. Um, and some of them have really reduced eyes and tarsi that are living deep in the leaf litter, deep in the fungusy leaf litter. So again, you get into this leaf litter and there could be about 30 or so species just in this one little patch right here, equal to all of what you find in the foliage up above, if not more. That's very special about um, tropical forests, especially tropical cloud forests. Another thing you notice in, in, in these tropical places, just how, how much different shades of green there are um, when you're walking through the forest is just sort of astounding. Um, and if you, you know, if you happen to look down and, you know, in your house, around your house for, um, in, at least in North America, most of what you find would already be described, but pretty much any uh, insect you would see crawling across the forest floor here would probably be undescribed to science. Um, and unfortunately, there's, there's um, getting less and less of, of the habitat. Uh, so here's some pictures of Pachyrhynchus obumanuvu. It um, has this very bright red um, coloration on the elytra with these sort of bright green um, spots. Uh, and my co-author, Anne Cabras, she thought it looked sort of like um, 
the 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 wear that that the Obumanuvu people wear, and so that's um, why we gave it its its uh, name. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'd like to thank my uh, co-authors, Athena Lamb, James Henderson, who helped a lot with the genomics work. There he is, standing next to um, some servers. Um, Annalyn Cabras and Milton Medina of the University of Mindanao and the University of Mindanao and the Aiden Lab at the Baylor College of Medicine for help sharing their genomic techniques. Okay, thank you. Hi, Matt. Thanks so much. This was amazing. I just went on like a like a journey and a half looking at those leaf litter weevils um, specifically. <laughs> like, so cool that they just hang out there in the leaf litter doing their yeah. thing, looking like leaf litter. <laughs> um, yeah, they don't have any need yeah, for, for bright coloration because they're usually they're pretty cryptic. And so most of their other predators would be, you know, things like blind snakes or, or or fossorial mammals, or probably mostly other arthropods, centipedes, and, and such. And so a lot of yeah. those are also very armored. Um, ants, probably ants. We tend to find a lot of ants. You don't tend to find a lot of leaf litter weevils. Where you find a lot of leaf litter weevils, you don't tend to find very many ants. Um, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting how like, you know, within weevils, there are these, <laughs> the ones that look like leaf litter and there are ones that are beautiful and colorful. And then accordingly they have <laughs> their own sets of like species interactions, which, you know, just seems like it speaks even more to like the bigger picture of, wow, you know, we understand biodiversity based on observations of singular species like this, right? Like, yeah, pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, there's just so much that we don't know. There's so many that are undescribed. I mean, I have probably 40 or 50 undescribed leaf litter weevils from, from Luzon and Mindanao at, at, and just sitting in the academy, but it's hard to find time to um, describe them all. Yeah, yeah, seriously. Um, well, uh, back to the colored weevils that you described here, um, Stuart asks a question. Uh, when you find a new color pattern in a new weevil, how do you know that it's not, uh, or sorry, how do you know that it is a new species and not just a unique individual variation. Um, can you tell us a little bit yeah, that's a, a little more on that? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, because oftentimes that's what's happened in the past is that a lot of these early um, sort of Victorian era um, scholars described these from very few specimens and they weren't able to put together that, oh, these ones with the open bands and these ones with these closed bands, those are actually from the same population because they never went there and they never observed them, they never dissected the genitalia and looked at the genitalia closely. And so, you know, having theories and having characters that aren't selected on convergently for an aposematic defense um, would be one way that you don't get fooled. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes you just see color patterns that are just completely and unique and if you have a even if it's a small series that's enough to tell you that there's something going on especially if it's um one where you don't see any of the other ones that you know of co-occurring yes thank you yeah 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 and um like uh i guess the another kind of related question with with geography playing in is like you know you showed that map of these weevils are found here, these are here, and there's kind of like an idea of where they're distributed. Um, do you have like a clear picture of how the geography of the area over time has maybe impacted speciation events? Um, which is kind of like a big question on its own, but. <laughs> yeah. No, it's um, it's complicated because the, 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 geolog the geological history of the Philippines is very complex because there's a lot of different fault lines coming on. And so a lot of those islands, especially the ones with sort of strange, often um, uh, two different islands that have come together and accreted, um, forming one larger island. Um, and so there you get, so even though you might have things that are sort of on mountains next to each other, some oftentimes they look very, very different because they were on different um, plate tectonic um, islands um, that just happened to, to line up at this time in history, but speciated much earlier. Yeah, well, 
And I, I imagine that must be a pretty crazy thing if they ever come into contact with one another. <laughs> yeah, so that's, I mean, you do, you do see in an area you might get four or five different species of Pachyrhynchus. Um, some sort of will all converge on one pattern, um, but sometimes there's some other ones, they, they don't seem to change. Um, and so it's not always, it's not always quite clear um, what exactly is going on. It, it, it can be very local. Like these populations can be very localized to one little ridge and you go like a kilometer this way and you get another set. So when I say like four or five species in an area, I mean like maybe like 10 kilometers um, in any one region. Mm -hmm. There's usually just only a couple um, and they're very yeah. patchy populations. So the predators are keyed in on, on just what's, what's occurring there. Wow, that's that's pretty amazing. Like even for a relatively small area to have so much um, difference in diversity and like species, yeah, that's pretty pretty amazing. Um, yeah, and then uh, Deanna asks, um, do we understand broadly how different species um, kind of recognize what what mimicry does for or like the advantage of mimicry, um, which is I guess like a also, how how does do we understand broadly how mimicry evolves across different organisms, or is it just like a lot of different things playing in? Um, um, well, I guess it depends what sort of type of mimicry. Um, I guess sort of this, you know, um, Malarian mimicry. It seems to provide them protection from predators, so that they're not um, eaten or maimed. Um, so that if they're not harassed or eaten, then they'll be able to leave more offspring. And if they leave more offspring, then, you know, it's just sort of the, you know, Darwin's theory, then they're, they're going to go on, be more successful, the more, you know, those, those alleles or those patterns going to be more prevalent throughout the population. Um, mm -hmm. but basically on an individual level, it just helps them to survive, um, and avoid attack from predators, lizards or birds, perhaps some, some arboreal small mammals. Um, yeah, yeah, that makes that makes a ton of sense. Um, and finally, uh, this is a really serious question. Um, which weevil has the cutest snoot in your uh, scientific opinion? Um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> rostrums and it's not actually a snout you know it's not a it's not a nose because their mouth parts are at the end of those rostrums so it's really like you would take you know like <laughs> area and like exactly a snoot out. a snoot you know like not a snout yeah. but a snoot yeah. <laughs> yeah i don't know i hadn't really thought about that um it's putting you on the spot with this one like, um, i like the the cryptorin kind weevils the ones in the leaf litter because they they you know they tuck their snout in and, <laughs> yes they have a, 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 you know, a sternal channel that they, they hide their rostrum in and their antennae and everything. Um, yeah, and they're, I think they're just fascinating because they're, you know, nobody's really studied them and there's just so many different uh, forms of those. Um, like a lot of the Pachyrhynchus have really bright colors, but their form is all sort of sinuate sort of... Um, beetle, whereas the, the leaf litter ones are warty and, and, you know, just sort of weird, weird, looking things. They're like things you wouldn't even necessarily think think of, you know, it would never enter your mind for a weevil to look that way. So it's always neat <laughs> to see a new one of those. And you're like, whoa, that's, that's so different. Um, mm -hmm. They're defying the norm outside the... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the outside your expectation, yeah. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Thank you for, <laughs> for um, answering uh, leaf, leaf litter weevils. Um, but but yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing uh, about your work and, and your story of discovering these these amazing little guys uh, and describing them. Um, yeah, so great to have you on. Yeah, and thanks for inviting me. Thanks for everybody for sticking around. Yeah, and uh, I will bring Lynn back up on screen. Hi, Lynn. Hi. <laughs> Sign us off. <laughs> I loved, loved your last question. Um, 
Thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. A uh, special thank you to Allison, Chris, and Matt. Uh, before we sign off, just a little night school update. Um, this is actually going to be my last time co-hosting night school. <laughs> um, I'm gonna be hopping off the production side to focus on our in-person events, which is where I normally am, I'm not in this room. Um, and I hope to see some of you there. Uh, just want to say I so very much appreciate having both night school and all of you during this weird pandemic time. Um, it's been a lot of fun, but I do have some exciting news um, to accompany this update. For those of you who have been watching, who have been watching with us um, from the beginning, we're bringing back another friendly, familiar face um, who's actually backstage or has been backstage this whole time. Christina, do you want to come back? I like the I like I like the I like the backstage. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. The backstage. Here I come. It's a stage. It's a stage. Yeah. So we're playing a little tag. So Christina, you're back in. Yep. <laughs> Hi everyone. Welcome. <laughs> um, we will be back. Wait, was it February third? Um, so in a, in another month from now. Um, stay tuned for details um, on our website. Yeah, stay tuned, subscribe, um, so you can be notified when uh, when we return. But see you in roughly a month. Thanks for tuning in today. Yeah, and everyone clap for Lynn. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful to um, <laughs> post with her, and we will miss her at night school. Go visit her at Nightlife. Yeah, yes, come hang out. It. Mm -hmm. Have a good night. Right. See you all next month.